During the 2016 presidential campaign, <clears throat> one of the phrases we heard often <clears throat> from one of the candidates who is now our president, Donald Trump, was this. We're going to build the wall and... Come on, we're going to build the wall and... Mexico's going to pay for it, right? Now, <clears throat> this phrase received a lot of good publicity and a lot of bad publicity. Good publicity from those who see illegal immigrants as a huge problem for our country. Bad publicity from those who are here illegally and they don't want to be deported back to their country. Bad publicity from some who think it's in inhumane to not allow those who are suffering in other countries to come into our borders, across our borders, even if it's illegal to do so. And I thought it very odd last year when talking to believers during the 2016 presidential campaign that many believers were ignorant of the fact that walls were actually biblical and that there was met one man in scripture that even wept prayed and fasted because the walls of Jerusalem had been broken down and they no longer had the borders to keep their enemies out of their land. Ladies, this, na his, this man's name is Nehemiah and we're going to look at his prayers in this lesson and we're going to draw some numerous principles that you can take home. So let's read chapter one. Actually, because of time, and we will be looking at all these verses individually. Well, never mind. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it fast. <clears throat> The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakila, Hashilah, and it came to pass in the month Kislev in the 20th year as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant who are left of the captivity there in the providence are in great affliction and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for many days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven and I said I pray Lord of heaven oh great and awesome God you who keep your covenant and mercy and those who love you and observe your commandments please let your servant be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant which I pray before you now day and night for the children of Israel your servants confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against you both my father's house and I have sinned We've acted very corruptly against you. We've not kept the commandments, the statutes, or the ordinance which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray you the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you're faithful, I will scatter you among the nations. If you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you are cast out to the farthest parts of heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you've redeemed by your great power, your strong hand. Oh, Lord, I pray, please... Let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Now, if you have an outline there, which I hope you do, you're gonna see, we're going to see the scene, the situation, the seeking of God, and the statement. Now, before we look at the scene, what's going on, a few facts about the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah wrote the book of Nehemiah as evidenced by the first few words, the words of Nehemiah. It's written after the exile of the nation of Israel, a book very similar to Ezra. If you've never read Ezra and Nehemiah, if you ever read them together, they depict both of them, the faithfulness of God in restoring the people back to their land. And Nehemiah had risen to a prominent position, the king's cupbearer, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And that was pretty amazing because he lived in a very pagan culture. And what Nehemiah accomplishes in this little book is absolutely amazing. Of course, we know without God's help, he would not be able to accomplish anything, just like you and I. Without God's help, we can't accomplish anything. Um, I wish we had time to study the whole book. We don't. I've often wanted to teach Nehemiah, and uh, my husband told me the other day that he's going to teach it. As soon as he gets done with uh, the Gospel of Mark, he's going to teach Nehemiah, so I'm very eager to... Uh, here it taught verse by verse. But we can say this, Nehemiah was a man of great faith, great courage, and he was a man of prayer. And I trust, as I said, that as we end our time with this prayer, that you will catch a glimpse of that and uh, take some home, home some principles that will help you. So let's look at the scene. 
The scene is in verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hashila, came to pass in the month of Kislev. In the 20th years, I was in Shushan, the citadel. Now, as mentioned, Nehemiah wrote Nehemiah, and his, word mean, his name means the Lord has comforted. And indeed, the Lord did comfort him by answering his prayer. His father's name was Hashila. We really don't know anything about him. The scene depicted here is the month of Kislev. This is the month uh, which begins in November, our November, and ends in December. Uh, the 20th year would be the year 444 BC. And the time this prayer takes place, and the place was Shushan, the citadel. Uh, you might say, what is that? Well, this is the winter residence of the Persian kings. And so we can conclude the scene. The month is um, April. No, is that right? Yeah, no, our November, December. And the weather is pretty cold. And the place is the palace. Now, after writing where he was and when it was, Nehemiah then writes of what prompted him to pray this prayer in verses 2 and 3. So we now have the situation going on which prompted him to pray. <clears throat> Notice what he says. Hananiah, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, concerning Jerusalem. Now, Hananiah was evidently a literal brother of Nehemiah. If you look over at chapter 7, verse 2, it talks about him again. Uh, chapter 7, verse 2, it says, Then I gave my brother Hananiah, the ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem. He was a faithful man, and he feared God more than many. So, uh, Hannah, Hannah was ne excuse me, Nehemiah's literal brother. Um, the purpose that he came, why he came to visit his brother, we don't know. I mean, maybe he just wanted to see his brother, see how he was doing. Maybe he came to visit Nehemiah to tell him of what was going on, that the wall of Jerusalem had been broken down, the gates had been burned with fire. And so anyway, he comes to visit his brother. And Nehemiah, being the man of God he was, he, he was a compassionate man. And so he asked, how are my people? How are the Jews? Have they survived? What's going on with them? And he's not only concerned about the people, he's concerned about the city in Jerusalem. And so the men answer in verse 3, and notice what they say. They said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province, they're there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates are burned with fire. Those who survived, Hananiah says, they're distressed. They're, they're in reproach because the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates have been burned with fire. Now, the wall he's talking about would have been the one that was built after the people returned from captivity. And without a wall around the city of Jerusalem, the people would be subject to their enemies and they wouldn't be able to defend themselves. That's why they built walls in the biblical world. That's why our president wants to build a wall uh, to keep enemies out of our land. And ladies, I think it's worth noting before we go on. Nehemiah was just going about doing his daily duties when he learned of this news. And isn't that the way it is with most de devastating news? I mean, you're just going about doing the laundry or putting dishes in the dishwasher, you know, running errands, and you receive what? Some devastating news. That's what, Nehemiah, what happened to Nehemiah, just going about his business. And that happens to us often as well. So the situation, if you're taking notes, it's pretty bleak. Broken down wall and burned gates. So how did Nehemiah respond to this tragic news? Well, he responded by seeking God in prayer. Notice what he prays in verse four. So it was when I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for many days and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now ladies, Nehemiah was very upset about this news and he did the same three things Hannah did, wept, fasted, prayed. Same thing she did. Nehemiah had compassion for his brethren and it caused him to pray. It drove him to pray and fast. And notice, he sat down. You might say, well, why did he sit down? Well, in the biblical world, when someone would mourn, they would usually sit down. And you know, I was thinking about this even in the 21st century. How many times do you get a phone call, are you sitting down? I have some bad news. Why? Because when we receive bad news, 
difficult news, what? You kind of get weak in your knees. <laughs> and so you need to sit down. And so they did it in the biblical world. We do it in our world. And the text also says he mourned for many days, which actually, do you know how long Nehemiah mourned? Four months. Four months. You might say, well, how do you know that? Well, look at chapter 2, verse 1. It came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of Adarxerxes, the king, that wine was in form. I took up the wine, he gave it to the king, and he had been sad I, in his presence. And the, the month the Nisan there is our April. Now, we don't believe he fasted for four months, but he was mourning for this long. Now, ladies, all this grief led him to pray. In fact, one man says this, all this time he probably spent in supplication to God waiting for a favorable opening in the divine providence. Every good work is not to be undertaken hastily. Prayer and watchfulness are necessary to its completion. And listen to this last statement. Many good works have been ruined by making haste. Nehemiah thought about this for four months before he approached the king. You know, I used to have a rule in my marriage that I would not approach my husband about something I wanted to talk to him that I knew was going to be difficult until I prayed about it for six weeks. Now, I've learned, I I've hopefully have grown in my marriage and wisdom, so now I just, you know, I think that doesn't even, these things don't even matter in light of eternity, so I'm not even going to bring it up. But uh, I had to do that to myself to keep myself from making haste doing things that were unwise. Many things have been ruined by making haste. Nehemiah thought about this. He mourned, he prayed for four months before he went and made an appeal to the king. Or, yeah, to the king. Well, notice who Nehemiah addresses his prayer to, the God of heaven. <clears throat> the God of heaven was a common title for those living in Persia at this time. And Nehemiah was brought up in Persia, so it makes sense that he would use this title. We also know that uh, Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that we pray to who? Our Father who's where? In heaven. He's heaven. That's where he is. So we now look at the actual prayer he prayed during this distressing time. I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Now, ladies, Nehemiah begins the same way Jehoshaphat began. What? Acknowledging who God is. Again, we would be wise to follow these examples instead of just flippantly and hurriedly coming to the throne of grace and saying a few popcorn calls to heaven and, you know, that's it. Amen. He's the Lord God of heaven. He rules. He also acknowledges God is great. The same thing Jehoshaphat did. He's awesome. He's powerful. He's majestic. And he also acknowledges that God keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and keep his commandments. Now, why did he do this? Why did Hannah do that? Why did Jehoshaphat do that? Ladies, when we rehearse who God is, it encourages us. God will keep his promises. He is mighty. He is strong. And he's strong enough to help Nehemiah and, their, and his people in their weakness. And my friend, this is one short verse, but rich, <laughs> about the character of God. If Psalm 145 was just a little bit too long for you, why not just look at this verse right here? That's pretty rich in the character of God. Well, Nehemiah goes on to pray in verse 6, Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night. For the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. Interesting, Nehemiah begins with plea, please, please. <laughs> He's begging God. You're my father. I'm your child. Please be attentive. Please see. Please hear my prayer. In fact, the hearing here means to hear intelligently. <laughs> please hear my prayer. Listen to it. You know, the Apostle Peter encouraged the readers who are suffering under wicked leadership. He says, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. Isn't that great to know that God is listening? He listens intelligently. He listens attentively to our prayers. And it's interesting, Nehemiah mentions here, he's praying night and day. Night and day for the children of Israel. This is a situation Nehemiah goes to bed and prays about. And he wakes up and it's the first thing on his mind. Ladies, we've probably all had situations like that. Have you ever been so overcome with a situation 
that you lay down at night to go to sleep and that's all you can think about and pray about. And when the alarm goes off the next morning, that's the first thing on your mind. And you lay there and you, you pray about it. You just can't shake it. Nehemiah couldn't shake it day and night. He prayed about it day and night. Well, Nehemiah next prays something that we all should consider when facing trouble, and that is our trouble might be because of sin. Nehemiah says, we've sinned. Me and my fathers, we've sinned. Even though Nehemiah is concerned for what's happened to his people, he's wise to realize, realize that this might be because of sin they have committed. And so he confesses not only their sins, but his own sins. You know, I appreciate this because Nehemiah doesn't think he's above sin. You know, sometimes we like to confess the sins of others, but we fail to acknowledge our own, right? In fact, Nehemiah is not the only one that did this when a nation was facing calamity. Ezra did, Daniel did, uh, many Old Testament prophets did. In, in uh, the epistle of James, James even mentions a man that is sick, and he might be sick because of his sin. He says, if is anybody sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil. And the prayer of the faith will save the sick. And if he has committed sins, they'll be forgiven him. That guy was in trouble because possibly of sin. Even Paul mentions those who take the Lord's Supper unworthily. He says many are sick and many have died. They've died because of sin. Ladies, we would all do well to look at our heart when facing trouble and ask, Lord, is this because of sin in my life? I mean, I, you know, I think of often when somebody gets sick, I used to go to a, a doctor who was also an elder in our church in my husband's first church many years ago. You know, one of the first things that that doctor would ask me before he examined me, how's your spiritual life, Susan? I thought, you know, looking back, I thought, that's a weird question to ask your patient. But looking back, Dr. Nunley was a very wise man. He knew what many of us should know, that many times our troubles are because of what? Of our own sin. And so we all would do well to look at our heart when facing troubling times and say, Lord, is there a sin I need to confess and repent of? And so Nehemiah goes on to mention the sins they've committed. We've acted very corruptly against you. We've not kept your commandments. We've not kept your statutes or the ordinances which you have commanded your servant Moses. Now ladies, notice Nehemiah doesn't call sin a mistake like my friend did. It's not, it's not a psychological problem. It's not my husband's fault. He calls it corrupt. <laughs> corrupt. <laughs> Ladies, again, we would do well when we come to the throne of grace. Don't minimize your sin. Lord, I made a mistake. I'm really sorry. You know, I got irritated with my husband. No, you didn't. You got angry. That's what God calls it. Anger. Don't minimize your sin. I had an affair. No, you didn't. You committed adultery. Use biblical terms. Look at your sin in light of God's holiness. And notice he says the sin is against God. It's just like David after he was confronted by Nathan the prophet and he cries out to God in Psalm 51. He says, against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. I've sinned. Now, Nehemiah doesn't tell us specifically what they've done. But he mentions three parts of their sinning. He doesn't name the specific sins, but he mentions, first of all, the commandments. He puts them in three categories. The commandments, and that would be not just the Ten Commandments, but all the commandments of God that were given through Moses. They had obviously broken some of these. Secondly, he mentions statues. These would be rules and regulations. For example, one of those would be keep the Passover. And so that might have been something they had broken. Those are statues. And then the third one he mentions is ordinances. Uh, these are legal decisions or judgments or procedures to implement. For example, not just keep the Passover, but keep the Passover on the 14th day of the month. And so it gets more specific. And so Nehemiah says, they have broken your commandments, your statues, your ordinances. And he doesn't name the specific ones but he just names general ones. Well, after acknowledging who God is, after acknowledging their sins, he then asked the Lord to remember a promise he made in verse 8 and 9. He says, Remember, I pray, I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest parts of the heavens, 
I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Ladies, Nehemiah knew the word of God so well that he could remind God of what was written. That's another good reason to memorize scripture. You know, we saw that, what, with Jehoshaphat. He knew the word of God so well that he could also remind himself and God of what was written. Do you? Ladies, during troubling times, we would do well to remind ourselves in our praying as to what God has promised. We just saw that in Jehoshaphat's prayer. And here in this prayer, Nehemiah reminds God of what was written in a few passages. And I'll just read a few of these for the lack of time. But in Leviticus 26, uh, well, in fact, I don't think I will read them. But Leviticus 26 through uh, 27 through 33, Deuteronomy 28 is full of the promises that God made. If you will obey me, I will bless you. If you disobey me... <laughs> I will bring all these curses on you. And so basically that's what he's referring to. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy chapter 28. Ladies, the principle is the same in both of these passages that Nehemiah is rehearsing. Disobedience brings cursing. Obedience brings blessing. If the nation of Israel disobeyed, they were not only going to be scattered, but they're going to receive all these punishments. Read, if you want to sober read before you go to bed tonight, read Deuteronomy 28. That thing is sobering. For disobedience, cursings in the city, cursings in, you know, all these plagues and all this stuff going to happen to you and your children. Ladies, the principle is the same now as it was then. However, if they obeyed God, he would not only bring them back to the land, but he would shower them with blessings. Ladies, when we're in distress, we must often realize it might be because of our sin. It might be because of the sin of someone else. We need to confess. We need to repent and then watch the Lord work. And I'm not talking about just, you know, coming to the Lord and saying, you know, I'm really sorry I did that. I'm talking about repenting, you know. I, I know I've shared this example. I've been here so many times. I know I've shared this example, but I'm going to share it again. About the time I kept going back to my husband asking forgiveness for something I was doing. And I can still remember in the bathroom, the house we were living in at the time, and I did my dirt daily duty of going in and asking for forgiveness. And he said, I'm not going to forgive you. And I was like, what? He goes, you're not serious. You're not repenting. And you know what? He was exactly right. I wasn't repenting. I was confessing to him, but I had no intention of turning away. And you know what? God used that, those words of wisdom, to get me to repent. And I stopped doing what I was doing. I stopped it completely. That's what we need to do. Not just mouth words, but really repent. Put off the sin or the sins that have gotten you in the mess you're in. <laughs> well, Nehemiah continues on in his seeking God in prayer, and he prays in verse 10. Now, these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Now, Lord, do as you promised for these your servants and your people that you have redeemed by your power and your strong hand. These are your chosen ones. These are the ones you've set your love on. Lord, you're powerful, you're strong. In fact, he's already mentioned these attributes in the beginning of his prayer. And he ends his seeking of God in verse 11. Notice what he says. Oh, Lord, I pray, please, please, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. Please, Lord. Please, Lord, I beg you, hear my prayer. It's interesting, he doesn't ask God that his eyes be open as he did in verse 6, but he does beg him to hear his prayer. And not only hear his prayer, but he says, hear the prayers of others. You might say, well, who are the others? Well, you know what? I bet those people living in Jerusalem with their wall broken down and their ga gates burned with fire, do you not think they were praying too? I'm sure they were praying, and, isn't it, and they were 800 miles away from Nehemiah at this time. That's a long way. Isn't it wonderful to know that geographical distances don't keep us from praying with other brothers and sisters in Christ? A couple weeks ago, I got a letter from where I've been in India several times, the, the seminary there that I've gone to teach at, and, and uh, they were asking for urgent prayer because 20 drunk men had come into the seminary, beat up a bunch of seminary students, and just, I don't know if it was complete destruction, but destroyed a lot of the seminary there in Pune, India. And you know, I brought that to the throne of grace and took it the next day to our, we, had, we pray on Sunday morning before church at 8.30 and 
shared with my brothers and sisters so we could be praying for our brothers and sisters in India. Isn't that great to know that miles don't keep us from praying? And so Nehemiah, yeah, he's praying. He's praying about this situation. But he says also the prayers, others' prayers, the prayer of your servant, the prayer of your servants, <laughs> the ones who are in Jerusalem, I'm sure they were praying. They were crying out to God for help. Well, he has one last petition, and that is, let your servant prosper this day by granting him mercy in the sight of this man. Now, who is he talking about? Well, he's referring to the king, who would have to be the one to grant him permission to go to Jerusalem to see what was happening. Now, you might say, well, why? Well, because of the statement that he mentions in 11b. So we move from his seeking of God to his statement he closes with. I was the king's cupbearer. Do you know, humanly speaking, not divinely speaking, but humanly speaking, only one person could make it possible for Nehemiah to go to Jerusalem, travel 800 miles to check on his people, see if this was true, that the wall was broken down, the gates were burned with fire. And that one person was the king. The king, that's why he says, give your servant success. Give me favor. I need to go to this man and ask him if I can leave. Why, you say? Well, a cupbearer cup was a trusted position by the king. You know what the cupbearer would do? They followed the king around wherever he went. It's kind of like our president today. You know, he has bodyguards that will take a bullet for him. And in fact, they say there's one guy, if you ever see Donald Trump, you see him right next to him because he's watching. He's going to take the bullet in case, I hope he'll take the bullet, in case someone tries to assassinate our president, which I'm surprised hasn't happened yet. But um, <clears throat> anyway, the cupbearer would drink the cup first. He would drink the wine or eat the food or whatever it was, and then he'd give it to the king. So many people hated the king, like many people hate our president. And so they would try to poison the drink, the wine, or the food, and kill him. And so the cupbearer was the one that got to do the tasting first. And then if he didn't die, well, it was okay for the king to do it. And so can you imagine having a man like that, like Nehemiah, that you could trust so explicitly, someone that would be willing to die for you? And this guy's going to come and ask you, can I go to Jerusalem? I need to check on my people. And so he, you know, he had a very tr trusted position. And so for the king to have to let him go, that was a big deal. And so Nehemiah would have to be given permission to leave his position of trust and honor to go to Jerusalem. So we have the scene in verse 1. The scene is winter. It's a palace with Nehemiah working for King Artaxerxes as his cupbearer. What are the particulars surrounding your difficult situation today? What is the situation? Nehemiah hears through his brother and some other men that the children of Israel are in despair and danger as the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates have been burned. What bad news have you received lately? The seeking of God, Nehemiah responds by weeping, fasting, praying, and his prayer consists of adoration of God, confession of his sin, the sins of others, and supplication. How have you responded to your current difficulty? Have you wept? Have you prayed? Have you fasted? Have you cried out to God in prayer? Have you adored him? Have you confessed your sin? Have you made supplication regarding your difficulty? The statement was, he was the king's cupbearer. What's your occupation? Are you a mother, wife, homeschooler? Employee, employer? You know, whatever your current calling is, it doesn't matter because we can learn from Nehemiah. He just didn't sit and do nothing. He prayed. He acted. In fact, I wish we had time to go on to chapter 2. We can see he talked to the king. He went to Jerusalem. He helped out with the wall. What are you going, what are you doing to work out your difficult situation? Well, did God answer his prayer? He did. God answered his prayer, but it was not without difficulty. It was not without a lot of hard work and a lot of opposition, if you've ever read it. In fact, they build the wall with one hand and hold the sword fighting off the enemies with the other hand. I mean, it was difficult. Nehemiah had to do his part. Ladies, sometimes we think we can just pray and watch for God to answer and then do nothing, but that is not the case. Nehemiah continues to pray. In fact, he prays 11 times in this little book. 11 times. 
He was a man of prayer and he never stopped praying. In fact, the prayer we looked at is just one out of 11. Now, we don't have time to go over all the rest of them, but I want to give you some numerous principles from Nehemiah's prayers, and they are in the acrostic Nehemiah, so you can remember as you take them home. Now, I know that you might not be needing to rebuild a wall, but many of you today are facing trials that are overwhelming, and so it feels like you're trying to build a wall. <laughs> What numerous principles can we glean from Nehemiah? The first one is the N on your acrostic. Never give up praying. Never. Never give up praying. Nehemiah prayed 11 times. The prayer we just covered. He prayed when he heard about the persecution. He sought God for wisdom. Three times he asked God to take vengeance on his enemies. Four times he asked God to remember him for his good. He prays for strength for his people. He prays to, that he would judge those who are in sin. What is your difficulty today? How much time have you prayed about it? Ladies, never give up. E, expect opposition but continue to pray. Expect opposition, but continue to pray. Now, the opposition that Nehemiah received was pretty significant. Ridicule, mocking, trying to discourage him from building the wall. If you've ever read Nehemiah, if you haven't, you need to. What opposition have you received during your insurmountable trial? Did it drive you to further discouragement, or did it drive you to your knees? Ladies, expect opposition, but continue to pray. H, help in the process as needed. Help in the process as needed. You know, after discovering this bad news that the wall was broken down, the gates were burned with fire, after he got permission from the king to go, do you know he went, I love that part, he went, he traveled at night, he went and checked it out, he went to see if it was really true. Was the wall really broken down? Were the gates really burned with fire? And then after he found out it was true, you know what he did? He helped. <laughs> he went and helped. James says in, an epistle, in his epistle, when going through trials, we're to let patience have its perfect work. In other words, we just don't go, let go and let God. We do something. We're active. While we're waiting for God to answer our prayer for this insurmountable trial or that thorn in our flesh, we're active. Are you being active doing what you can do in your present trial to get it resolved, or are you just sitting around hoping for a miracle? Nehemiah went and did something about it. E, exhort those in the process who are in sin. Exhort those in the process who are in sin. You know, when faced with opposition, Nehemiah rebuked those. Do you know he rebuked those who were guilty of opposing the project of building the wall? In fact, if you read the whole book of Nehemiah, you will notice there were many times that others were in sin and Nehemiah rebuked them. <laughs> he did something about it, man. This guy, I told, I told my husband, today, this man is a man, not of prayer, but courage. He had no problem confronting others. He did something about other people's sin. Are there any people involved in your trial that are sinning? Have you lovingly gone to admonish them in the Lord? M, make sure you pray first when bad news comes. <laughs> make sure you pray when bad news comes. That should be the first thing you do. When Nehemiah heard the news, what did he do? Wept, prayed, fasted. First thing he did. He didn't, of course, he didn't have a cell phone then, but he didn't get on his phone, post it on Facebook. He wept, he fasted, he prayed. Ladies, this is a far cry from texting, tweeting, and posting on Facebook, which is what most of us do. Now, thinking over the past few trials that you have encountered, can you honestly say you prayed first? If not, why not? Make sure you pray first when bad news comes. I, it's not wrong to ask God to remember the good that you've done. It's not wrong to ask God to remember you for the good that you've done. You know Nehemiah did? Four times. He says, Lord, remember me for my good. Lord, remember me for my good. What good and noble things have you done during your difficulty? 
Have you asked God to remember you for the right things you've done? Nehemiah did. A. Ask God for strength for all involved in the situation, or in the solution, sorry. Ask God for strength for all involved in the solution. <clears throat> Nehemiah did. Who are the persons involved in your current problem? Have you asked God to help them with his almighty power? And then lastly, H. Honestly evaluate if the situation is as serious as you have been told. Honestly evaluate if the situation is as serious as you have been told. What was the most recent difficulty you encountered? Did you check it out to see if all the facts were true? You know what Nehemiah did? He went, he checked it out, make sure it was true. You know, Nehemiah knew the wisdom of Proverbs 18, 13. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it's a folly to him. It's foolishness. You know what the Proverbs is saying? You check out both sides of the story. And ladies, I have learned the hard way as a biblical counselor, you know, because I used to, in my earlier years, everything a woman would tell me, I believed it like the gospel truth. And, you know, I thought, man, her husband must be the biggest monster that ever walked the face of the earth. And wait till I get my hands on him. And then, you know, we would call the husband in. My husband will come in for that part. And, uh, you know, after hearing his side of the story, he's not a monster. She's a monstrous. And uh, I'm like, seriously, you didn't tell me that part when you told me. Remember, there's two sides to every story, but Nehemiah went and he checked out the facts. Make sure that it's true. Now, the end of the story is that the wall was completed in 52 days. This does not mean that your difficulty is going to be solved in 52 days. I wish it were. That is not a principle that you can take home from this prayer. It might be two days. It might be two years. It may not be till glory. But ladies, we have the same awesome God Nehemiah had, and we have the same access that he had to bow the knee and cry out to God for help and then do what we could, can do to solve the problem. As we continue our journey through this life, I can hope and pray that we will follow Nehemiah, Hannah, Paul, Jehoshaphat, and the sweet singer of Israel, David. They followed their master on their knees. Will you?